Get that? Anytime it says the Holy Spirit, it's all capitalized. <coughs> that the Spirit that dwells in us, who's us? This is talking to people in the church. Huh? Lusts, that's an unclean spirit. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. To envy, envies 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 10, Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If we're involved in these kinds of things. And yet he's saying that these things can be inside of us. If you want a list of the things that could be inside of you, you can go over to Romans 1. It says people within the church can be filled with. And then it goes on and it gives a whole entire list. Filled with means it can be inside of you. This is why Jesus has included within his gospel deliverance. Whether we like that or not, whether we agree with that or not, whether we want to do that or not, regardless of what our opinion is, Jesus said on the church, after the work was perfected up on the cross, he said, lastly, I want to say something very important on you. And everybody went, oh, what's it going to be? The last words of a dying man. And he came back and he said exactly the same words he said on the very first day of his ministry, which you can find in the Balm of Gilead, Isaiah 61, verse 1 and half of verse 2 which can also be found in Luke 4.18. He said out of the church about his own ministry that four things had to be done for it to be real ministry. We had to get people saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, preach deliverance and set free captives, heal and deliver the bruised and the broken, bring physical healing to the body of Christ. And then he died, went on the cross, went in the tomb, came out of the tomb, came back to a meeting of people who had... All of them had given up their ministry for fear of the Jews. They had locked the doors of the church, and they were in there hiding. Well, that's a pretty good sign of the magnificent work that Jesus did, isn't it? But they could not believe. They were still filled with things that should not be there. Except for the woman who got delivered of seven demons. See, she could believe it. The woman who got delivered, she went up there, didn't she? Mary went up there. And Jesus showed up and he said, well, I just want to tell you my last words. And everybody went. You know what they were? Exactly the same thing. This is the thing the church hates the worst. This is the thing they deny the most. That Jesus came back and said exactly the same words that he said on the opening day of his ministry because we all want to play. No. Uh, everything's done now and everything's worked out. Uh, Galatians 3.13, James, he went up on that cross and he took all the sin of the world away. Well, if that's true, then I can't sin. And I don't have to ask forgiveness for sin. If we're going to go that far, now religion will turn around and go, well, we're not quite saying it like that. But if there's sin, there's a consequence to sin. Hello? Yeah. Don't go and do the same thing. It can come back worse. Isn't that what Jesus kept telling everybody? Came back and said the same exact thing. Go ye into the world, Mark 16, verse 15 through 20. Go ye, lastly I say unto you this, go ye into the entire world and preach the gospel to everybody. And of course, everybody was sitting there going, okay, well then now we got to relearn what the gospel is now that you did the perfect work. Because Galatians 3.13 says, he went up there and he took all the curses of the world he took it all away. And if you believe that, <laughs> you're not going to get free. You're not going to understand it. Because the scripture don't say that. They say it says that. Take a look at it for yourself. you got a Bible, hopefully. He took, he broke us from the curse of the law. I agree with that. The religious spirit don't agree with that. They'll say they're in grace until they want to put you under the law to condemn you. No. There's plenty of curses still in the New Testament. 
I'll, I'll show you a bunch of them tonight. Well, there's plenty of them. You can come in and get cursed in your own church. Come in and take communion without examining yourself and putting your sins under the blood of Jesus. For this reason, damnation comes upon you. People sleep early. They die early. And for this reason, people get sick. I mean, if that's not a curse, in your own church, all kinds of stuff. Changing the gospel, Galatians 1, 6 through 12, right? We ought to know this by heart. If I or an angel of God or anyone, anything else ever comes and preaches another gospel other than what you have seen, Luke 4, 18, let them receive a curse. This is written to the church. Not all those people out in the world. You go out and you start preaching that salvation is the gospel of Jesus Christ and you're going to get a demonic spirit. What? Yeah, because there's still three commas after that. Get saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, comma. No period there. Preach, deliver, and set free captives, comma. Heal and deliver the bruised and broken, comma. Physical healing. And all the way in the end, Jesus came back and they all listened and he just went, same thing. Go in the entire world and preach the gospel. Oh, okay, what's it going to be now? Get people saved and baptized. That's verse 16. You can look at it yourself. You have a Bible. Verse 17, he says, unto those who believe. If you believe in Jesus, these signs will follow you. If you believe in Jesus, these signs will follow you. You, not just the preacher boy, we all have ministries. These signs will follow you. You will cast out demons in the name of Jesus. So if you're not doing these things, are you a believer? Well, that's a hard question. I don't believe so. I don't believe so. I don't believe. You. What is a believer? It's John 3.16, James. No, that's not a believer. A believer is someone who believes what Jesus says. Not just believes you're saved. I mean, if believing in Jesus makes you a believer, then demons are believers. Because they said, we know who you are. You're the Son of God. If you come to torment us before our time, the Bible says, demons know the word of God and fear and tremble. You have to be better than a demon. You have to do more than a demon. Demons believe in deliverance. But they don't do it either. You will lay hands upon the sick and the sick will recover. Lay hands... That's what I want to talk about tonight. Your hands. Because this needs a lot of work. There's a lot of stuff right there. Your hands. If you're going to go out and do something for God, <laughs> this is what you're going to use besides your words. Those are the two main deals. Finger of God is connected to the hands. Luke 11, 20, if I by the finger of God, Cast out demons. You will know the kingdom of God. Your hands can bring the kingdom of God with your words. Are your hands prepared to go out and do what you have learned here or what you have learned from here in the word of God? It goes on to say that you will operate in the power of the Holy Spirit, in the gifts. It says, then the disciples said, Okay, we believe that. They went forward with signs, wonders, and miracles following them. If you believe Jesus, signs, wonders, and miracles will follow your ministry, not believe in Jesus. You can believe in Jesus and have nothing happen in your ministry. But to believe Jesus... You don't just need Jesus as your Savior. Having Jesus as your Savior means you believe in Jesus. Having signs and wonders and miracles following you means you believe Jesus. It's completely different to have Jesus as your Savior and overhear your Lord. He said to people who were accepting him, why do you call me Lord? They called him Lord, but don't do what I say. 
And this is where 90% of the church is today? Not that we're the Golden Boy Church. We're not. But this is where most of the people are today. They call him Lord. Why call me Lord? They call him Lord, but they will not do what he says. And we won't do it either. We go and we, we put our tithe into those kinds of things. We put our offerings into those kind of things. We come in and we get involved in all the bicycle club ministry and the save a tree ministry and the cookie baking ministry and the car washing ministry and you know we be involved in all those kinds of things while denying the gospel itself and believing that we are accomplishing great works in Jesus Christ but he gives more grace Wherefore, he says, God resists the proud. Why won't we do what Jesus said? Because we're full of pride. We're full of stubbornness. We're full of rebellion from the sins of our generation. And we are undelivered. But he gives grace to the humble. Submit. Oh, that's a hard one. Submit yourselves therefore to God if you're not doing the gospel of Jesus Christ you are not submitted unto God and you can love Jesus we believe that I mean anybody goes to church of course they love Jesus resist the devil what I mean if we're saved why do we need to do that I thought and he will flee from you from you no, I'm in Jesus Christ. There's no devil with me. From you. This is to a saved church. Here we go. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Today the church goes, no, that's not how it works. We come into church to usher in the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's crazy. This is God's house. He ushers us in. Why aren't godly things happening today? Where is the same words, the same kind of spirit that Gideon said? Well, if this is from God, I don't know. Because I, I, according to my forefathers, if this was from God, we'd be having all these signs, wonders, and miracles that our fathers told us about. And God came in and gave the answer. The occult, the perversion, the rebellion, the stubbornness. He made the whole list, and that list is still here today. That's what's holding you back. He said, well, what do you want me to do? He says, I'm going to raise up a judge. A judge is a national level deliverance ministry that operates as an apostle, prophet, teacher, deliverer. That's what they do. It's always God's way. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Everybody's going, come Jesus, come Jesus. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Jesus is going, come, church, come. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, but nobody wants to answer the door. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands. What? Wait a minute. I, I accepted Jesus. I went down under the water. I speak in tongues. I go to church. Cleanse your hands, people in the church, you sinners. What? And purify your heart. Where's your heart? Out here? Or inside. Jesus said that a man from evil treasured heart brings forth evil treasure. So you can have evil in your heart. What is evil? A bad thought? That's not what scripture says. Evil is evil. Evil is the enemy. You can have this stuff in your heart. You can have this stuff in your hands. And until you've purified your hands, how are we going to go out and use your hands for God? successfully 
Now, you can operate in the authoritative position of Christ. Everybody can stand in the authority of Christ. We could teach a little parrot and bring him in here, and I could put him on the pulpit, and he could sit here. Come out in the name of Jesus. Come out in the name of Jesus. Come out in the name of Jesus. And eventually, if there's a demon, that demon's going to start to... And I know Satan will go, no, he didn't give no authority to a parrot. He gave authority to us. No, that's not true. The Bible says, I heard every creature on earth and the creatures below the sea praising God. Let everything that has breath praise God. So they're all involved too. It's not that the parrot has the anointing. He don't. But he has authority because there is authority in the name of Jesus. You can cast out a demon with no anointing at all. I know this is, this is oh, that little religious spirit, he's in there going, <laughs> isn't he? You can go out and cast out demons with no anointing. Plenty of people get healed in churches that don't believe anything about the gospel because God says, "Howbeit I do it not for your sake, but for my sake, and I will be glorified. It's all over the New Old Testament. We don't want to be in that kind of place. We want to move past our authoritative position. There is just authority in the name of Jesus. But that's not where we want to operate. We want to operate in the anointing of God because in the anointing of God, we don't have to tell demons to come out. Not, I'm not saying that we don't tell demons to come out, but we don't actually have to do that. And even if we did, we could walk around just whispering. In the beginning of my ministry, I had these curses and I would be standing in the back praising God waiting and there'd be 300 500 people waiting to hear the word of God and this happened over and over and over I would be in the in the back and I'd be praising God and all of a sudden my voice I would lose my voice this thing would just grab my voice box somehow I don't know how but I would just lose my voice and I'd be standing back in the back, and I'd be hearing the enemy going, you've had it now, you've had it now. And I'm supposed to go up and preach. <laughs> Talking to somebody. And, uh, and I found that if I could just make myself <laughs> go up front in faith, that when I would come up, and just touch the altar, my voice would come back. <laughs> and that worked that way for about a month. And then one day, I came up and I went, And it didn't work. And I said to the Lord, what should I do? He said, command the demons, come out. I mean, from out here. And I'm thinking, what? And I walked around like this. And everybody looked like, What kind of trick is this? <laughs> but after a couple minutes, they started coming out and people started to get healed. Because God took me by my faith into the place of anointing and I learned, I learned through and by this that I could come into meetings and just start to, as we just saw in the video, just come in and just start giving God praise I could whisper a couple times, I command everything, you come out in the name of Jesus, but no, nobody could hear what I was saying. And the rest of the time, I'm just walking around just silently praising God. 
and things are coming out. We have to move past our authoritative position in Christ into the place of the anointing that it comes down to break the yoke. And in order to do that, you've got to move into Isaiah 52, verse 11. Be ye holy, all who handle the vessels of the Lord. You've got to do some cleansing. It takes a lot of cleansing because you just can't go in and do that. It takes preparation, and that's what I want to talk about here tonight. He says to the people in the church, cleanse your hands and purify your hearts, you double-minded. You only have one mind. You can't have a double mind. That is physically, but not spiritually, impossible. You can only have one mind. I mean, duh. So whose other mind is the double mind? The enemy. Your mind is going like the little angel on Bugs Bunny's shoulder. I wouldn't do that if I was you, Bugs. And the other mind is going, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> and this is what deliverance can do to be able to help you. Let's go over to uh, Isaiah 1. I give you a praise, Jesus. We'll, uh, we'll start in verse 4. A sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, excuse making, a seed of evildoers, a seed. It's generational curses coming down. Children that are corruptors, corruption is a word for hell that have forsaken the Lord, they're in church right now. Do you see that? They're in church right now. But it says they've forsaken the Lord. And don't let Satan go, well, that's, well, of course, I mean, that's a Jewish thing. That's not us. No, this church belongs to Jesus. This is a Jesus church. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Jesus was there the whole entire time. Jesus walked in to church just like this, and every demon cried out, we know who you are. Because it was his church. But the demons were freaking out to see Jesus in his own church just the way they freak out today. My friend, when Jesus walks into his own church, demons cry out and begin to come out. People start to get healed, start to get free. They want what he has. They're drawn by the magnet of the Holy Spirit. That is a sign of Jesus being in the church today. Why should you be stricken anymore? They are stricken. Why will you revolt anymore? They're in rebellion. The whole head is sick. They're full of sickness and their minds are tormented by unclean spirits. Their whole heart is faint. They're ready to quit. They're ready to give up. Sound familiar? From the sole of their foot even unto their head, there is no soundness but only wounds. Proverbs 6.14 says that you can get used to being sick, but a wounded spirit, who can bear that? On top of it, they have real wounds, physical wounds, things that the enemy has done. Remember Lazarus and the rich man. He laid there and he was full of sores. Why? Because his life was completely out of order. So was the rich man. One wasn't good and one wasn't bad. One had just simply accepted God. If this guy was so good, why was he full of sores, which is a curse, and full of poverty and lack, which is a curse too? And bruises. I come to heal and deliver the bruised and the broken hearted, faint heart, and putrefying infection, putrefying sores. They have not been closed. They have not been bound up. They have not been treated with ointment, which is the balm of Gilead, Isaiah 61. 
or the balm for your eyes for the Laodiceanic church that has become religiously blind, the spirit of Laodiceana. Laodiceana means man's church and not God's. But in the name of God, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned. Your land, strangers are devouring you with poverty and lack, enemies coming against you. You're being overthrown. Look at verse 12. When you come to appear before me in church, they're in church, who has required this at your hand to even come into my church? Who invited you to my church? Oh, that's not the love of God. Other Old Testament prophets said through the word of God, oh, if only someone be, would be brave enough to lock the door. Oh, that's not the love of God. No, but that's the word of God. Bring no more vain oblations. Don't burn no more incense for me. It's an abomination. What is incense? A sweet-smelling fragrance up before the throne of God, the prayers of saints. According to the book of Revelations. Stop with all of your religious ceremonies and rituals and your Sabbaths. Quit calling the men's meetings, the women's meetings, the, all the church groups together. I cannot bear it away with it. It is iniquity to even come to church and try something like this. My God, what? What? Your new moons and your appointed feasts, I hate. God hates it. They are trouble unto me. You can trouble God. I am weary. You can weary and wear out God. To bear it. When, here we go. When you spread forth your hands in church, lift up holy hands in one accord. <laughs> I will hide my eyes from you. When you make many prayers, I'm not going to hear any of it. Your hands are full of blood. What? Are they full of blood? I mean, if you walked into church right now and you and then you went, everybody put out your hands, would you see blood on them? No, of course not, because you have to wash your hands. You have to be in that washing lever, don't you? Wash your feet, wash your hands before you can go in the temple. Isn't that right? Oh, no. They have made dead cup on the outside mighty darn clean. But inside, it's full of dead men's bones. Oh, I'm sorry, did I just say something that Jesus said? <laughs> what should we do? Our hands are full of blood, meaning all the destruction that we and our families have done, all the things that we've been involved with that we should not have been involved with, it's all there still in our hands. And if you believe that Jesus took all that out when you got saved, then you don't know the word of God. Again, unto those who believe these signs will follow. Again, James 4, 7 through 8, wash your hands. Do you think he's talking about going to the bathroom? Washing your spiritual hands is a commandment by God to the church in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Well, how are we going to do that? Read some Psalms? How are we supposed to do that? Wash you, huh? Make you clean. Who makes me clean? Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Stop the evil. Cease. Learn. Learn? Yes. Learn. How am I going to learn? From good teachers. From people who are going to come in and talk to us about spiritual things. 
Who's going to teach us the Word of God? Learn. It's not automatic because you're in God. These people are in God. If you talk to these people right now, God, God has a problem with you. You know what they said to Isaiah? We go to church. How dare you prophesy unto us smooth things and put that kind of God behind our back. That's what they told him. They sawed him in half in the end, didn't they? For telling the truth. Learn to do well. This is part of doing deliverance. But it's not just about deliverance. Deliverance is not going to solve your problem. Deliverance is going to help you with your problem to solve your problem, but your problem is going to be solved by you resisting the devil that he flees. You have to be actively involved in this, and you can't just go around blaming everything on a team. And until you do, you will not be pleasing unto God. Learn to do well. Seek judgment, righteous judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Oppression is an unclean spirit. How are we going to relieve the oppressed? Well, mostly through deliverance. But we can also do things in the physical. When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked? Okay, we know those kind of scriptures. Matthew 25, 41 says, And those in the church who do not do such things, I shall say in the time of judgment, Depart from me, you cursed children. So we can get curses. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widows. Come now. Let us reason together, says the Lord, because right now it's unreasonable. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Everybody's read this, I hope. If you be willing, if you be willing, if you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good things. But if you refuse and you rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. My mouth has said it, says the Lord. Look at verse 26. But because they would not do it, I'm going to restore the judges just like the first. Judges are national level deliverance ministers for wayward nations who speak out against great opposition. Hmm. John 20, <clears throat> verse 20. And when he had, had so said, he showed the disciples his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Why do you do that? Jesus showed his hands to show the work that he had done with his hands as a testimony, even up on the cross. His hands were required, weren't they, of paying the perfect price. Satan nailed his hands to prove that he could capture and stop the power of God. This is what Satan wants to do with you. And until you deliver your hands, Satan will control much of it. You will not be able to operate in the fullness of the anointing of God, whether your religious spirit tells you you can or not, you won't. You have got to unnail your hands. Verse 25, the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails, I will not believe. One of the real signs of a true apostle is the proof of having anointed hands. Today the church will tell you, oh, we don't go for that, and that's not really what the church is about. It's not about all that signs and wonders and miracles. We're a worshiping church. We're called to just worship. We're called to just rest in the love. That's Satan talking. 
There's no such thing as a worshiping church. Now there's churches that worship, of course. Elijah said, bring forth the minstrel that the hand of God, the anointing shall rest upon me. We come in and we praise God. The power of God increases. God inhabits the praises of his people. Okay. But praising God is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't care what them churches say, they're lying. Acts 5 verse 12. And by the hands, did you know? At the top of the fivefold ministry is the apostolic. Did you know that? Why is that? Look at uh, Hebrews 3, verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus Christ. Now, if we don't need apostles, then we don't need Jesus because that's what he was. That was the model for the church, sitting at the top. That's what he did. He raised up apostles. Today, there's no apostles anymore. Hardly at all. The church has starved them and murdered them and locked them out of churches. No one ties into their ministries. Hardly at all. And they've been starved and they've been run out of town. Because the church doesn't want the Lion of Judah. They just want the Lamb of God. And we have made excuses so long of believing that's true. The only way an apostle can come in and have a meeting nowadays, he's got to come in and rent a hall. Or even, God forbid, rent a church from the rebellious church of everything money. But even then, mostly they can't do it because they'll ask you, well, what are you going to do? And the minute you start talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, Amen. that door's locked to you. And today the pastors are claiming that they are the apostolic, that they are the fivefold ministry, that we don't need all the rest of those things. Me and my wife, we got it covered. And this is the spirit of religious control and manipulation and holding you down in your religious sheep pen. When they need some milk, when they need some wool, they'll come and open the gate and come on in. But the rest of the time, that gate is closed. Amen. This is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Acts 5 verse 12 says, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought amongst the people. By the hands of the apostles. You see how I just keep saying how important the hands are? Mark 16, 18. Lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Luke 4, verse 40. Now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick or people with all kinds of different diseases brought them on to Jesus, and Jesus laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. His hands. Luke 13, 13. And he laid his hands hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Behold, Jesus has come to make the crooked thing straight which is part of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Leviticus 8 verse 24 And he brought Aaron's sons and Moses put the blood upon the tip of their right ear this is the ironic anointing. This is how we anoint people into the ministry when they get ordained. We anoint their right big thumb, their right ear, 
and the right big toe. And he put the blood upon the tip of their right ear, upon the thumbs of their right hands, upon the great toes of their right feet, and Moses sprinkled the blood upon the alt altar round about. But without deliverance, in Zechariah 3, all the pastors had become so defiled, God had no one he could use anymore who was clean. And God said, we've got to somehow turn this thing around. Let's start with one of the pastors. Bring me Joshua, the high priest. And they brought him, and it says, and Joshua was standing there in filthy rags. Spiritual. Right? This is Revelations 3, verse 3 through 5. Blessed are those who keepeth their commandments. They shall walk in white with me. If your garments are not white, you can be clean by becoming an overcomer to walk in white. This is part of the scripture. And it says, as he stood there in his filthy rags, that Satan stood on the right side of the pastor. He can't be on the right side, technically. But really, he can. Satan can stand on our Jesus side. The right side is the Jesus side. Satan should be behind us, get thee behind me. But he's standing on the right side, which is the position of Jesus. Jesus, it says the angel of the Lord, comes and approaches from the front. And Satan, standing on the right, rises up to oppose the cleansing process of this pastor in order for God to start ministry all over again. And Jesus says unto Satan, You are an offense unto me. Behold, this is a firebrand. Somebody's going to leave their mark in fire. Isn't that what the scripture says? Behold, the one who comes shall baptize you in the Holy Spirit, comma, power, comma, and fire. Three different things. You need three different things. Not just the Holy Spirit. That's just not, not the Holy Spirit. You can get above and beyond that. It says that Jesus was filled with a measurable power. But on there, each person is given a measure of power according to several ability. But we can rise up again. We can rise up in that and we can be anointed more. David was anointed three times for the same kind of position. You can be anointed over and over and over in your ministry and receive more and more and more. This is why I've been telling you people, you've got to get these anointed guys that are coming in from around the world. They're coming in here, lay hands on you, and pray for you. <coughs> Satan will tell you. Somebody asked me today, well, uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I had a guy lay hands on me one time, and, and uh, all of a sudden this, this big demon came into me. And, uh, you know, the, uh, James, the Bible says uh, lay hands on no, on no one suddenly. <laughs> That's taking way out of That means you consider before you start praying for people to start stirring up gifts and put them into the ministry. You consider that person first, but it's not about not praying for people. You don't get demons from somebody putting their hand on you. <laughs> I know Satan will tell you that you can until we're questioning everybody if you listen to a demon, he won't allow anybody to come and pray for you. The Bible says we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You don't get demons from people praying for you. Duh. You go, well, what about those people, James? I mean, didn't you just say that people's hands are, can be defiled? Yeah. But how's that going to get into you? Demons come in from sin. Right. Proverbs 26 and 2, a curse without a cause cannot come. Don't listen to Satan. Prayer is good. Well, then why did that thing happen to that guy? I told him, because you already had something in there, and it got stirred up, and then the demons went, see, every time someone tries to pray for you, it's just going to get worse. That's the biggest trick in the book with demons. Of course. You hearing a voice in there arguing about that? Go to the scripture. Rebuke him. Go to the scripture. I don't care what your opinion is. The Bible says you'll lay hands upon the sick. <laughs> hmm. 
Daniel 10 and 10. And behold, a hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. Hands in submission to God and the hand of an angel coming and touching him. What happened through and by that? Through the submission to God, he got new gifts. Exodus 17 and 12. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and her held up his hands, the one on one side, the other on the other side, until the going down of the sun. Why? Because your hands can be used, if they're in submission to God, can be used for warfare. So if they can be used for warfare, we should know by understanding spiritual things that it is vital... Oh, there's the anointing. <laughs> it is vital that the enemy somehow get a hold of your hands to stop it. Wouldn't you think? Of course. Satan knows the word of God. He knows the word of God. Psalms 24. Let's go over to Psalms 20. Psalms 24. I'll give you a praise, Jesus. Some people starting to get, get the revelation. Starting to get the revelation. I'll give you a praise, Father. I lift you up. 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 That's right. Psalms. That's right. That's right. I give you praise. I give you praise. I give you praise. I give you praise. I give you praise, Jesus. I lift you up. I lift you up. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise. We give you praise. Psalms 24, verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill, O Lord, or who shall stand in this holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. This is why, in order to get to stand to come before the Lord and to stand in a place of holiness. This is why it says in James 4, 7 through 8, to the church, this is the same scripture. He that has clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto pride, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive the blessing from God. Want to be blessed from God? Clean your hands and purify your hearts. That's a mighty revelation right there, my friend. I give you a praise. Psalms 18, 24. Therefore has the Lord recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanliness of my hands. The more that you cleanse your hands, the more God will reward you with the spiritual things. It's up to us. The scripture says, cleanse your hands. Cleanse your hands. Does it say, Jesus, cleanse your hands? No. Cleanse your hands. We have to be involved. Huh? John 13, verse 9. Jesus said unto Simon Peter and all the other guys come over here I want to wash your hands and feet Peter said you ain't doing that to me you're never going to wash my feet including his hands Jesus turned and said if you don't, if you don't get washed you got no part with me did you hear that? 
If you don't get washed, you're going to have no part in this. And you can be in Jesus and you can be sitting in church but not be with Jesus. You can be in Him but not with Him. Mark 6 verse 2. When the Sabbath day was come, He began to preach in the church. And many hearing Jesus were astonished saying, From whence does this man get these things? How does he know this stuff? And what wisdom is it which is given to him that even such mighty works are wrought by his words? By his hands. Because this gospel is not preached in the wisdom of men. The Bible says the traditions and the rudiments of men make this gospel of no effect. Today we believe when we go to church, they have all these incredibly brilliant theologians. They can tell you the color of Moses' beard and what kind of sandals the Romans wore and this kind of leather. and I mean, they're just full of all kinds of stuff. Incredible information if we were historians. But the Bible says this gospel is not preached by the wisdom of men, but in demonstration and power by the Holy Spirit of God. And it doesn't matter what they say, blah, 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 for three hours, and everybody taking notes, what great grandma used to say. <laughs> By signs and wonders and miracles, regardless of how well they talk. It is proof that God is in the house. Proverbs 31, verse 13. Here's a very hard one. This woman is harder to find than a ruby. Do you know how hard it is to find a ruby? My God. In verse 13, it says, She seeks wool and flax. She works willingly with her hands. Do you know that 12 of the qualities of the virtuous women are all the things that she does in her hands. Twelve different times the Lord shows that the qualities of this woman is worked by the hands in obedience unto God. <laughs> Don't ever marry a lazy woman. <coughs> If you're thinking about getting married and your fiancé has a snooze alarm, here you go find somebody else. <laughs> Get you another one. You headed the wrong direction. That's God's honest truth. That's a sign right there. Either, either you're going to run and not grow weary, walk and not faint, or you got yourself a lazy, controlled woman. <laughs> John 21 verse 18 Verily, verily, I say unto you When you were young, you girded yourself and walked the way that you wanted to walk But when you shall be old you shall stretch forth your hands and another will gird you and carry you away whether you would not Disobeying God can bind your hands with curses until others control you Uh, Jeremiah 25, verse 7. Yet you have not hearkened unto me, says the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. The things in your hands can hurt you spiritually. The things that you do with your hands can affect your life. For good or for bad. And if your hands have been used for bad, you can change that. You can go back and cleanse it. Obviously, we've seen the scripture. This is why. 
I believe that this is one of the most important messages at the end of this workshop. And I really debated over which one to do and really sought out the Lord. But in order to really go out there and do it, we need more than knowledge. We need cleansing preparation. Matthew 27, verse 24. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was going on, he took water and he washed his hands and said, I am innocent of this blood, of this just person, which is a symbol that your hands can be spiritually guilty. It's also a symbol of blind error and hypocrisy of believing that we can wash our hands physically. I think it's Jeremiah 2.20, thank you, Jesus, uh, that says, though you take much soap and much nitre, which is a cleaning solution, yet your hands shall be marked before me. You can have marked hands, mark of Cain. You can hit me, you can kick me, you can steal from me, you can do anything, you just can't kill me, signed God. You can have marks on your hands. You can have curses on your hands. Now are you going to go do something for God with cursed hands? You can do it in the authority, but how about in the anointing? And that's where we're trying to go. Father, I give you praise. 